And in the meantime, starting off from the point it did leave off from, after Joseph had been dumped down a well by his brothers and rescued by a band of travelling merchants, who just happened to be wandering through the desert, and who did promptly sell him into slavery while his brethren did decide what they should do with him, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither, and stopped off to trade at his hand and uncle's house. And the Lord was with Joseph, for he had grown bored of listening to harp music and did crave a bit of adventure, and had decided that in this episode he was going to star in a cameo role in the unfolding drama, and he presumably, meaning Joseph, was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So, regardless of power and wealth, he was still nothing more than a domestic servant and a slave. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Though when his master did talk unto him, he did respond in a way that his master could understand us not. And given Joseph's unequalled talent of flower arranging and his uncanny eye for style, did presume that Joseph and the Lord were together as an item, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So despite his initial prejudices and assumptions, his master did allow him to hang around the place, despite the fact that the odd can of lager and the occasional plate of spicy pigeon wings did go astray from the fridge, though strangely the falafel did remain untouched. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, for he did have a wonderful flair for interior design, and all that he had put, he put into his hand, which, considering how this narrative is unfolding, and how Joseph is thus being portrayed, should best go unmentioned, though this probably did in fact mean that Joseph did become his personal assistant, and thou shouldest be ashamed of that self for thinking otherwise. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and also because the master chef did make a most divine spicy shish kebab, that the Lord would pilfer whenever he could lay his hands on one when the chef wasn't looking. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field especially the herb and the cows, for of all the things that the Lord did create, he did love them the best. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, for he did have more important things to attend to, and what is the point of having staff to do the mundane things in life, if thou doth not leavest such things for them to get on with? And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat, which did make for a rather unhealthy, though admittedly high-fibre diet. For the Lord who was with him had had away the filling for his sandwiches when his back was turned. And Joseph was a goodly person, and well favoured, for he did spend more time than was necessary on the sunbed, perfecting his golden tan, and did burnish his contoured physique with baby oil and shave his chest, so that he would be smooth all over, and did verily gleam in the sunlight like a man made of gold. And upon seeing him you would swear that the vision of him standing there, with the Lord by him, who on this occasion did appear to be a small white and blue urn with a polished metal lid, that did move round by its own accord upon three legs and amid squeaks, squawks, and whistles, whence thou did talk to him, was reminiscent of a more iconic image from years hence in the future, and that somehow the two of them did seem right for each other, despite the way that they would bicker between themselves. And Joseph did stand in such a way, and have such pert buttocks, that centuries hence men who did write poetry in Arabian lands did admire and pass compliments among them. Despite such comments many centuries later, in these same self lands, being the type of comments that would get them lifted upon high, upon a thing called a cherry picker, and thrown from its platform, with naught but a rope tied securely about their necks, to protect them, lest their fall should cause them to be dashed upon the ground below. 
And it came to pass after these things, that while his master was out at work one day, presumably getting new power converters from Toshi Station, his master's wife, being both bored and verily sexually frustrated, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Goodness gracious me! Mistress, though I am fluent in over six million forms of communication, sadly, Cunilingus is not one of them. Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. For he did want us to let her down softly, and did us not want to point out that she was at least two score and five years his senior, and as she did live a life of luxury, and did sit around all day with nothing to do less gorge upon bowls of full madamus and falafel, and the occasional grape, and did closely resemble something called the walrus, that did wear a badly fitting wig and lipstick, though with more pronounced whiskers and slightly smaller tusks. And he continued. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, for he doth know that thou art not my type anyway, even without us all the bits that do sack, and not just because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The Lord God is a jealous God, and if he doth see me going off with someone else, he is going to throw a hissy fit, and we all doth know what happens when the Lord doth throw a hissy fit now, don't we? Hmm? And she did sit there for some time, open mouthed in the stunned silence, and then did mightily sulk. But she was not one to give up and take no for an answer. For she was indeed a sex pest, and it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her or to be with her, and wherever possible he would run away from her, waving his arms around, outstretched in front of him, talking unto himself about how such behaviour was indeed sexual harassment in the workplace, and that Master Luke would stand us for it not. And it came to pass about this time, that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. Which did make a change, for in those days Potiphar's house-house did indeed resemble a small country cottage, with a thatch roof and a pecket fence outside, and Joseph did so love cottaging. And as he did stand there, in a pose that did resemble a teapot, short and stout, with one arm a handle and the other a spout, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me, for she was indeed a cougar. And he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got him out. And he did run around the house, with him in his hand, swinging it around for her all to see. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, she did bury her face in it, and it breathed deeply in the aroma of his manhood therein, and she did get herself off, even though Joseph had run away and was fled forth. And the Lord did appear unto her, and did make a loud boing sound, and a compartment did open up within his polished lid, and from within an articulated arm, with at its end a long silver probe with a rounded end, did emerge, and did make a soft buzzing sound, and what would happen next would be removed from this narrative lest it get its rated triple X. And the scene faded to black, and a song with French lyrics that none understood but everyone knew the meaning of did play. That she called unto the men of the house, who, incidentally, as we had heard from the verse just three previous, were nowhere to be found in the house, which is why she had tried it on with Joseph in the first place. And she spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And several of the men did look unto one another, and did think unto themselves that she had indeed cried out with a loud voice, for it had been greatly distracting, and did go on for hours. And all of them did look unto the Lord, who did make an innocent cooing noise. And continuing, she said, 
And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me, and fled, and got him out. And they did imagine that the Lord did then sit there, and watch her as she did tremble before the Lord, in a mighty rapture. And when she had regained her breath and composure, he did stick him back in again. And there were sounds, as if someone was drilling for coal with a jackhammer, and tightening the wheel nuts on a racing car. And the passionate screaming did once again start once more. And she did lay there, in a dishevelled and exhausted, yet entirely satisfied state, laid up his garment by her, until his lord came home, his lord being her husband, Potiphar, by which time it was very late in the day. And wearing her hair rollers, and a pink face pack, and the most frumpiest of nightgowns, she spake unto him, according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me, and lo, in centuries hence, such a thing as she did describe would be known as a sympathy folk. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me, and fled out. And Potiphar did think unto himself that he was not as surprised, for his wife's voice, being lifted up above anything louder than inaudible, did usually want to make him flee from the room also, which was why he did as usually spend so much of his time being busy doing other things, and did leave her to pester his servant Joseph. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled, for his was indeed the emotion that her voice did usually elicit in him, which was why he did usually try to avoid listening to it. And Joseph's master took him, and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in prison, which, going by the laws of the land of Egypt at the time, that did call for a slave to be put to death, should they have sexual relations with the master's wife, did at least suggest that he might not necessarily believe a single word that his wife did say, or that he did send Joseph to prison for his own protection, lest his wife should attempt to rape him once more, for even the most brutal and repressive pit of inhumanity that are the prisons of the Middle East are but like a joyous green pasture up in heaven with the Lord when compared to that fate. But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison trundling along behind, making whooping sounds, but most notably, did not as tell him to avoid being thrown into prison in the first place, or help him escape, for he had been tasked with serving hors d'oeuvres on the master's sailing barge, though the master knoweth not that he did have a lightsaber secreted within him. And seeing that Joseph was, among many other things, a most extraordinary narc, who, as we doth know from several chapters prior, and the tales of him and his brethren, would rat on his fellow prisoners with the least amount of persuasion, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And because of this, the prisoners did find themselves altogether partaking in a great many intricately choreographed song and dance routines from popular musicals, and with their shaved heads and prison tattoos resplendent in their matching orange jumpsuits and chains, they were indeed a sight to behold as they did perform routines from Riverdance and Abba the Musical. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. For he cares not that the prisoners did sing amongst themselves, Gimme, 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 a man after midnight, or knowing you, knowing me, as long as they did us not riot or try to escape. Because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And it was because of this that late one night, Joseph was able to allow the Lord to slip past the guards in the back of a carriage off yonder into the desert, and up in one of the towers upon the wall of the prison a guard did train his bow upon the carriage, and his sergeant did command him to lower his aim, as signs of life within the carriage there were not. And it did come to pass, that after the Lord did wonder for forty days and forty nights in the wilderness, that he did come across a mysterious wise man and his apprentice. And the two of them did take him back unto their dwelling. And that night, whilst the apprentice, who was a mere slip of a girl who did dress in a long flowing white gown, and did wear her hair tied up in tight knots on each side of her head, did try to remove an object from the front of the Lord's urn. 
and lo, a light did suddenly shine forth from within a jewel upon the face of its silver domed lid, and a ghostly image of Joseph, his golden skin resplendent and bright, as if talking unto the Lord, did appear, and it did say unto those present, Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, for thou art my only hope. Thank you.